Those who have adopted older children. What were the first initial few days, months, or years like? We adopted an almost 15-year-old through international adoption. Without going into detail, pretty extreme neglect, trauma, and abuse growing up. We were his first family setting. The first year and a half was, to put it mildly, hell. We were the worst case scenario story they would warn you could happen during your adoption classes. Violent outbursts several times a week. Thankfully only directed at me. If they had been towards our other kiddo, this would be a different story. Multiple screaming, throwdown tantrums daily. Severe personal hygiene issues, food hoarding, extreme anxiety and hyper-awareness, horrendous trauma-based phobias of the dark, loud noises, small spaces, dogs, certain foods, rope, fire, etc. The only places he felt safe enough to relax were public areas with a lot of people around. Anytime you were one-on-one -on -one with him, he was on alert. We took him to therapy. All the therapy. Sometimes two to three times a week. We took our other kiddo to therapy to make sure he was doing okay during all this and put measures in place to keep him safe. We went to our own therapy and education sessions to make sure we were being as effective on the parenting front as possible, and to deal with the secondhand trauma from the stories our son began sharing with us as he started to trust us more. We converted our bedroom into a safe room, and packed up any household items that had personal significance and put it in storage. We set up an emergency call system so that we could have someone else over any time he had a violent episode, as he would immediately calm down if there was a witness. We enrolled him in a class to help him learn social and life skills, and we took him to karate class, which, given the violence, seemed like a terrible idea to a lot of people, but they helped him learn to feel more safe and in control of himself. We got him on a medication for his anxiety, which helped tremendously. About a year in, something clicked for him. I think maybe he finally realized we weren't going to abuse or neglect him, and that it was okay to let us in. He'd spent a lot of time trying to drive us away to protect himself. If he didn't care about our family, he wouldn't hurt as badly if we, in his words, threw him away. Spaces between outbursts started getting longer. The food hoarding, stealing, and personal hygiene issues disappeared. He started taking on more personal responsibility. He began participating in family activities and wanting to spend time with us. It has been nothing short of breathtaking watching him change and grow. We are nearly six years in now. Our son no longer has violent outbursts or tantrums. All grandma's antiques are back on our mantle. His phobias, while not completely gone, are far more manageable. Our goals from him have gone from keep him from ending someone and out of jail, to help him live independently and pursue his personal goals. And he changed his last name to ours. I get handmade cards for my birthday. And sometimes he gives me hugs just because. Parenting isn't supposed to come with prizes, but that first I love you, mom, was perhaps the greatest gift I've ever been given. Sometimes he tells me, I've had bad things happen to me in the past and I can't change that, but they can't make me do things. I get to choose my future. He's a pretty incredible person, and we are so proud of the young man he's become. And I'd just like to say shout out to the parents here as well. Adoptive parents, to be clear. Taking someone in who's had all this trauma and just is volatile in some way, it can't be easy. And, well, OP made it clear, it wasn't easy. But to have that level of patience and caring for this person who you don't really know until you get to know them, it's an incredible show of love, I guess. So great work, OP. I hope this kid is doing amazingly now. Story 2. When I was 14, a family at our church that was unable to have children on their own decided to adopt a child from Russia. After a long process of paperwork and a ton of fees, they went over to go meet her and bring her home. When they got there, they found out she had four older brothers and sisters living with her in the orphanage. Evidently, the orphanage had no issue splitting them up, but the family friends were not willing to do that. They did bring her home, but immediately started campaigning at church to get the other four children adopted. Three of the four remaining children were adopted within a week or two, but the oldest child was 16, and nobody wanted to adopt someone that old. At the time, I was 14 years old, and my older blood brother was 18. My parents were convinced that he fit too perfectly within our ages to be able to let him be split up from his other brothers and sisters, so we adopted him. After the same ridiculous amount of paperwork and fees that the first family had to go through, we were able to get him over to the US. When my parents brought him back, he didn't speak any English, and had been smoking cigarettes and working a construction job since he was 12. It definitely took a bit of work to get him to quit smoking and tell him that he had to start high school. The first year was a bit, uh, weird. We kept an English to Russian dictionary handy at all times to communicate, and we made a lot of borscht to help him feel more at home. Which we found out later, he hated. He loved computers and playing games, and was able to find friends at school very quickly with the same interests. Which was great, because people who play WoW all the time tend to stay out of trouble. He was actually really intelligent, and was able to catch up very quickly in school, but constantly used misunderstanding the language to get away with things. My parents did not let it slide, though. They would pull out the English to Russian dictionary and lay out how he screwed up. They were always sure not to single him out, though. When I messed up, they punished me exactly like they punished him, so that he could see it was no different for anyone else. Early on, he definitely tried to bully me, but he capped out at 5'5", five five and I grew to 6'2", so that didn't last long. 
I always enjoyed video games too, and we were able to start bonding over that as my older blood brother went off to college. Me and him never had a lot to talk about, but we would sit quietly and play games. I always kind of thought we just weren't very close, but as time went on I realized it was just an understanding that we were very different people, but we were there for each other. After a year or so, it was super normal. He was just part of the family. The biggest thing my parents did to make sure it was clear he was part of the family was to make sure they went to every single activity he was a part of. Every track meet, every school function, every church event, they were there. And they always dragged me along too. At the time, I hated it, but I realize now that they just wanted to make sure he never questioned whether or not he was part of the family. After high school, he went off to college and graduated and is now a successful construction manager who makes way more money than me, and he's not afraid to give me crap about it. I mostly see him at family gatherings, of which he comes to every single one by choice. But when we see each other, we immediately pick back up where we left off and try to hit each other in the nuts because, hey, he's my brother. Story 3. We adopted our two boys out of foster care when they were five and four. Not necessarily older, but older than typical. They were being abused in their foster home emotionally and physically, but that separation still took its toll. First, understand it's a bit jarring to have no kids one day and then the next you have two who are fully dependent. It's obvious, but still nothing you can be prepared for. Next, know that if they come from a bad place, they are going to be sure you are bad as well. They will be convinced no matter how nice you are, you'll do something awful soon. They'll test you, and they'll misbehave to test you. They'll conspire to test you. But persistence will make a difference. You'll get frustrated, but the rewards of giving these kids a stable, loving home will never, ever be replaced. It's been 10 years since we adopted them, and they're my best friends. We've seen them through so much. And while I certainly haven't been a perfect parent, I'm proud I've provided them a path and future they likely would not have had otherwise due to no fault of their own. Story 4. I adopted my daughter when she was 8. She's 13 now. She's a pretty easy person to get along with, so we didn't have any of the horror stories you've read about. However, certain challenges were inevitable. She and I are very different people, and her temperament and maybe her personality was already pretty fully formed when she moved in. So while my son, adopted at age 3 and I, can talk about things like politics, my daughter is not interested. This is just one example of a challenge where we recognize the difference in one another, and it took a while to figure out how to be close mother-daughter in spite of those differences. Probably the biggest thing, though, is if you adopt an older child, you must recognize and respect that their loyalty will always be divided, and that's okay. I know she loves her biological mom, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I know that she feels divided between her old life and her new one. My goal is just to make the division as easy as possible for her. So, what's it like? Challenging. Less so for me than many other people because my daughter was fairly easy and I'm pretty flexible. Is it worth it? Hell yes. Story 5. We adopted my sister at age 12. We'd fostered her for a year or so with her younger sister, who was 3. The youngest got adopted, as well as the two other younger sisters who were 5 and 6. Eventually, it just left her. We'd had multiple foster kids before then that we hadn't adopted, but she'd lived with us for a couple of years by that point and was calling us her family, and we thought, why not? We loved her, and she would have been stuck in care for the rest of her life if we didn't. She experienced horrendous abuse at the hands of her uncle that started when she was a toddler. Absolute bastard animal of a man. This made her relationship with men, in particular my dad, interesting. She'd behave a little inappropriately towards him, but it was what she'd grown up with and had been taught, so we tried to be gentle with correcting it. She would get very, very emotional if she was yelled at, would pretty much just shut down, it was horrible. Her eyes would just sort of blank out, and she would have tears flowing down her face. But she'd pretty much become unresponsive and just stare blankly, unless you gave her some space to calm down. A guy yelled at her in the cinema once for rustling sweet bags too loudly, and she completely lost it and started trembling. I wanted to punch him in his stupid aggressive face. The other element was that it took a long time for her to stop being afraid of us. One time, she was jumping on her bed with a friend and one of the slats broke. It was loud and my mom went upstairs to investigate and apparently found my sister trembling and pale green with the nerves. She thought she was going to be beaten. She also hides food under her wardrobe, presumably a habit from when food was a bit scarce. Overall, she's got a lot of problems and needs a lot of counseling, but she's now 15 and doing really well. She's a keen dancer, and she wants to go work as an entertainer on a cruise ship and go around the world. She's very happy with our family, I think, and we love having her. Story 16. My parents never adopted him, but when I was 14, we had a 15-year-old boy move in with us who stayed until he was 21. It was strange for me as a teenage girl to have an older boy who I'd never met move into my house and to see my parents take him in as one of their own. There were suddenly all these rules for me, like I wasn't allowed to wear pajamas around the house or be home alone with him for the first year or so. However, he turned out to be the loveliest kid. 
While we never really got over the awkwardness and never really bonded, the whole experience was overwhelmingly positive. In particular, my mom became much happier with the fulfillment that she got from the experience, as she had been struggling to find purpose in her life. He'll never know how much our family improved from having him, and one day, I hope I have the chance to tell him. Story 7. I'm a sibling. My parents adopted twice. One at 7, the other at 12, several years later. We are all over 21 now. I think our family has experienced both ends of the spectrum. Could not have been more different experiences. For the 7-year-old, felt like they had been with our family all along in a very short time, matter of months. It was so much fun watching them learn everything you take for granted a little bit. Trip to the swimming hole, seeing a dog, etc. Pretty much a Hallmark movie. The 12-year-old was a much more difficult adjustment. Still had great fun welcoming and getting to know them, but there was a totally reasonable lack of trust that made getting started slower. Obviously, loved them to pieces, but it often felt much more like a Mexican standoff than a honeymoon. There is some major detachment disorder. They never really let one parent in and probably never will. There was lots of lying and manipulation, triangulating family members, just all around very tricky. This is expected. You have to understand that every adult in this person's life has abandoned them. They learned to survive under harsh circumstances. It was heartbreaking for me to see and understand both sides of a broken relationship. For many years, one parent desperately desiring a healthy relationship with their child who they love, but also understanding it probably can't happen. There is definitely a chip missing regarding empathy, but you roll with it and love them anyway. I know it was incredibly taxing on both parents and the child, but ultimately they had a safe place to grow and to learn, and that's the job. Good vibes are a secondary luxury. Adoption is very beautiful, but it can also be earth-shatteringly difficult. I have a lot of respect for adoptive parents. Parenting is already difficult without modifiers. It has been beautiful for our family and also very difficult sometimes. Adopting two children at different ages at different times, yeah, that must have been really strange for the parents in some ways. And from the sounds of it, OP is spot on, they got two polar opposite experiences. But all that aside, it sounds like the parents gave a really good home to these kids. And it's what every kid deserves, I think. Without OP's parents and people like OP's parents, people like the 12-year-old they adopted may never have had good homes. And growing up would have been... I don't want to say nigh impossible, but it wouldn't have been pleasant. Adoption, I think, is a super important part of society. Underutilized in my opinion, but I also understand the biological draw of wanting your own child, so I can't really fault anyone for that either. Story 8. Adopted my daughter when she was 14. Every kid is different and comes with their own set of problems. However, all adopted children have attachment and abandonment issues. It was very difficult, but we pulled through and now she's 20 and doing great. It's very hard, but you gain courage and happiness from the knowledge that you saved a person's life. You can pull them out of loneliness, unhappiness, and living in fear, and give them love and happiness. Nothing else I ever do in my life is going to come close to how good I feel about my wife and I deciding to adopt. If you go for it, look for support. Get the government to help provide you with therapy for the child and yourselves. Learn about attachment and abandonment issues and the therapies that deal with them. Story 9. I have four adopted siblings, three of which were adopted as teens. The first few days were always rough. My brother Chuck got into a fight with my mom and left. He went to a friend who had also been putting him up for a bit, but couldn't stay longer than a night. When he got to school, he broke down in the principal's office and they called my mom. She left work and he apologized for the fight and absolutely begged to still be able to live with us. She told him, Just cause you screw up one time doesn't mean we're gonna give up on you. He moved back in and immediately made my brother and I look bad. He was so grateful just to have a place to stay, food every night, and to feel loved that any chores, etc. were the least he could do. My sisters were very similar situations. When my sister Liz crashed my mom's car, she hid at a friend's for like three days until my mom convinced her she was allowed to come home. Or when she got pregnant at 16, she couldn't even tell my mom. She just had to nod yes or no while my mom played 20 questions. As the years have gone by, all of them have grown into pretty well-rounded people, managed to make something of themselves. They definitely have noticeable emotional scars, but cope as well as anyone. Story 10. We haven't adopted, but we have had foster kids through the years. Uniformly, the older kids walk into the house, find the dogs, and interact with them first. Then they'll ask us where the TV is, we don't have one, and express disbelief and disgust that we don't have one. Then they resume playing with the dogs. The first few days are always really weird, because you've invited someone else with an entirely different culture or lifestyle into your home and you raise them. We find stuff they do a little weird and they find stuff we do a little weird. Two brothers we had, 6 and 12, didn't know the names of meals, for example. They called them all lunch. 
They'd never had real meals, just snacked on whatever they could find throughout the day, so they called it the lunch that we, my husband and I, eat in the morning and the lunch at night. The same brothers also steadfastly refused to wear shirts in the house because, well, they'd never done so. We recently had a chance to talk to the younger one, who is back in care in another part of the state, and we asked him what those first days were like. He told us he was so little and so scared that we would be mean to him. He was afraid we would beat him. He said that he was less scared when we had dogs and that he was really glad we became the parents God gave him. Words from his current foster mom, I think. Then he said he wanted to be a foster parent when he grew up too, so he could show kids it's not that bad. And my heart ate my throat, and now we can never stop fostering. Story 11. Haven't adopted, but did foster two 17-year-old boys. One turned 18, and after discussion about following rules and school attendance, decided he wanted an apartment and left very shortly thereafter. The last one is my forever kid, and is living with me still. He'll be 20 next month and is back at home after a not-so-great first year at college. He's enrolled in a tech school program for IT now. There's a honeymoon period at first where we're all friendly and hopeful, and putting our best feet forward. But real bonding it doesn't start until you get down to the routine of life and really start to learn about each other. Older kids, especially teens, come with their own worldviews based on their experiences, which you will likely not be familiar with. Or if you've been told about their background, you still won't have 100% of the story, especially from your kiddo's point of view. Those worldviews influence how they assess and react to situations and sometimes result in unexpected responses. One kid would tell me what he thought I wanted to hear and then do whatever he wanted regardless of what we discussed. One would refuse to buckle down and try harder at school when things got tough despite his high test scores and high grades from previous schools. One kid had no qualms about being homeless as he had done it before and didn't think anything of it. One would lie as soon as he would breathe. One would interpret every sad feeling as depression, and was obstinate about learning coping mechanisms, placing a lot of blame on people other than himself, rightly or wrongly. It prevented him from taking responsibility for his own emotional well-being. All those issues, I feel, are partly due to inherent personality, and largely influenced by the overwhelming lack of stability in each kid's life. Both my sons had significant ACEs, including failed adoptions and moms who refused to step up to care for them and all of their siblings. They haven't been able to trust or rely on most adults in their life. And you're an adult, so why should they trust you? You have to prove to them that you'll stick around regardless. It can be really tough. It can also be really rewarding. But for me, the biggest affirmation in choosing to foster older kids is knowing that I can provide stability and a definite constant for my kid, when other people and situations have been unreliable. If a kid knows there's an infallible safety net, they know they can ask for the help they need in tackling challenges and addressing life issues without eroding that resource. Learning to adult is the biggest challenge an older teen slash young 20-something can do, and being held accountable has been tough for my kid and me and my husband. I want to jump in and fix everything that I can to help make up for some of the crappy parenting and lack of resources my kid had as a child. But at almost 20, the best thing I can do is to expect and encourage him to do things for himself, while enforcing boundaries and consequences. I'm trying to help produce a self-reliant and productive member of society, who can grow up, get a job, and start a nuclear family of his own one day, as he has expressed a desire for, and not perpetuate cycles of abuse, criminal justice system contact, and self-destructive behavior. I'll continue to love and support my kid and hope for his success in life. I'll say it's a little more difficult to quickly develop a bond with the older ones because so much of the human bonding process comes from a release of serotonin and oxytocin generated through direct contact, which is easier with little kids and babies, because they need you more and are way cuter than most adults. But it does come with the older kids through connecting with their interests and needs and wants. Just a bit slower. Story 12. I adopted my two daughters when they were 7 and 10 from foster care. They came from a horrific home. They were both severely traumatized. First, going from no kids to a single, in my case, mom of two very broken children is not for the faint of heart. You need a very good understanding support system. Second, you need to have your own therapy sessions. It's incredibly helpful to vent to a professional who deals with emotionally damaged children as a profession. Third, they will have issues for a long time. There's no quick fix. Even if their birth homes weren't super traumatic, you have to remember, they lost everything. Their parents, grandparents, friends, teachers, classmates, neighbors, pets, toys, home, clothes. Just imagine everyone and everything you ever cared about and have ever known being loaded into an airplane and crashed into the ocean. Gone forever. That's what they have to deal with. The scars last a lifetime. Fourth, make sure their teachers, daycare providers, new family members, and parents of their friends know that they're going through this. The way emotionally damaged children act out can really catch people off guard if they're not expecting it. Give them tips on how to handle it if possible. Fifth, remind them over and over that it's okay to be sad, angry, scared, hurt, and whatever else they feel. It's important for them to feel it's okay to feel this way. Sixth, 
Many times, the child keeps their emotions bottled up until they feel certain they're safe. A lot of the time, they don't feel safe until the adoption is done and they're sure they're not going back. This is when the years of pent-up anger, fear, anxiety all come out. It can get really rough, so be ready. Remember, they're doing this because they feel safe with you. They have formed a bond with you. Seventh, give them as much choice as possible. Abuse victims suffer greatly from having their sense of control taken away. Do you want your glass filled with milk this high or this high? Do you want to go to bed at 8.20 or 8.30? Do you want bubbles in your bath or not? These things sound small, but every time they get to make a choice, they gain a little bit of control back. It adds up over time. Eighth, tell them you love them, and nothing they can ever do will make you stop. And they will test this. A lot. Mine are 15 and 18 now. It's been a rough road, but I couldn't imagine life without them. Story 13. My best friend's family adopted a kid our age when we were in high school. I think he moved in with them around 14 or 15 years of age. He still has a relationship with his bio family, and he doesn't refer to his adopted parents as mom and dad. He'll say second mom and second dad or just use names. But he does refer to my friend and her brother as siblings. We are all mid to late 20s now, and according to her, it's been really great. My friend and her family are small white people, and he is a really big black guy. So he'll sometimes show pictures of his adoptive parents to people and be like, this is my mom and dad. And when others comment about him being adopted, he'll pretend he has no idea. All in all, it was a great move. He was able to attend the college of his choice and go into a field of study he wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Story 14. I have two adopted nieces, 15 and 16. They were 8 and 9 when adopted. One has had to live out of state at a very well-managed psychiatric facility slash school of sorts for over two and a half years due to severe emotional issues related to PTSD. The other is very well adjusted and a great student who excels in a broad variety of extracurricular activities and has a wide circle of friends. However, initially and for the first few years, the younger one acted out and got in a lot of trouble requiring that she switch schools to an environment that better suited her needs and was more disciplined. She has also seen a therapist consistently since adoption. We believe the older one was abused more by the parents and their druggy friends due to her age, as well as her taking the brunt of abuse in order to protect her sister. It is very sad and one of the hardest stories to hear, parents or adults abusing and neglecting children. Even as babies and toddlers, this was the case for these girls, and their strength is truly admirable. I would break down every day coming to terms with this. Their biological parents also gave up their rights to the children and have had zero contact whatsoever in over five years. Story 15. Does an attempt to adopt count? We wanted to adopt from the foster care system here in California. We have one biological son, I will refer to him as G, who was 12 at the time, though he was 10 when we first got the idea. We went with a private agency that specializes in foster to adopt, which meant extra classes and lots of extra help. Our foster care system is overtaxed. There aren't enough good families, and the social workers are burned out. Going through a private agency means I can text the social worker assigned to our case and get an answer right away, as opposed to trying to call the county social worker and maybe hearing back in a couple of days. We were very prepared and had a lot of support. That being said, we were not at all prepared and did not have nearly enough support. A sweet seven-year-old, I shall refer to him as E, was placed with us at the end of September last year. His biological parents had already lost their rights and he was available for adoption. He had been in the same foster home for almost two years, but they were not good parents to him, whole other story. So his social worker wanted to find him a home where he was more wanted. We were able to have a transition where we spent some time with him before he actually came to live with us. At first, everything went fairly well. It was the typical honeymoon of a new placement that we'd learned about. We were very different than his bio home and his previous foster home in that we expressed constantly that he is loved and wanted. Whenever he misbehaved or acted out, instead of shunning him, we just loved him even harder, as we learned to do in class. It's the nature of foster kids to try and push people away by acting out, and it usually works. So when a family is not pushed away by bad behavior, it's a surprise. E did not feel worthy of our love, of our home, of having a good life in general, and this manifested in more and more difficult behavior. Going into the process, my husband and I discussed what the deal breaker would be, and we both agreed that if G was threatened in any way, either physically or mentally, we would not go through with the adoption. Unfortunately, that is exactly what happened. E could not accept that families like ours were a reality, that G was born into this loving home, and he wasn't. E said something along the lines of, G was born lucky and I will never be lucky. The thing that really tipped the scales was having a really, really good day. When a child first comes into your home, there's a warming up period where you sort of treat them like a guest. Everything is new and no one really knows how to act around each other. Then that and the honeymoon period wears off and the child acts out so much that everyone is on edge. We were always on high alert, what was going to set E off, but we had one day where E was relaxed. So we relaxed and everything felt like it did before he was placed with us. We were laughing so much and having just a great day. That night, E asked me, 
is this what your family is really like? I told him that, yeah, this is what a normal day looks like in our home. So he responded with, so I'm the one who ruined your family. There was no convincing him that he was making our family better, and that we could have every day be like today, that his life could look just like this. He was so convinced because of how he was treated in both his bio home and his previous foster home, that he was not only not worthy of a good home, but he was the reason things went bad. So just like we learned what happened in class, he kicked sabotage into high gear. It was textbook behavior behavior of trying to ruin something he didn't feel like he could have in the first place. Unfortunately, it worked. We went from uncomfortable to absolutely miserable. He began threatening more and more violence, and what went from needing to keep E and G apart at all times to practically needing them in separate homes. E was determined to make G's life completely miserable. G is an only child, so he had no clue how to react to someone constantly, well, bullying him. I know G is five years older and shouldn't take crap from a seven-year-old, but he's a good, sweet kid, who just doesn't know how to be mean in that way. E could not walk past a G without doing something to him. Hitting him, saying something rude, bumping whatever G was doing, etc. Just constantly bothering him. And my sweet, kind, gentle kid started to become an angry, spiteful person. And it got even worse. Everything that could be used as a weapon, knives, scissors, etc. were all locked up. So E got creative. He started threatening to take his own life, then mine, then G's. He described in detail how he would do it with a butter knife or a fork, whatever he could get his hands on. Unfortunately, the boys had been sharing a bedroom. Our home only has two bedrooms. We planned on adding one once the adoption went through. We dragged G's mattress into our room and he ended up sleeping on our floor. We locked our door at night. Now, as bad as this was, I was blind to it. Remember how I said we went through a private agency? Well, they're determined to get those kids adopted no matter how much the family is suffering. They never present the option of backing out. They want you to just press on. Your love will heal these children. We had a team meeting at our home to try and make things better. My husband and I were just exhausted, and one of us said how we wanted things to go back to the way they were. We were told, In our experience, families who back out never go back to the way they were. It was almost like a threat. It wasn't until I sat down with the therapist, who G had seen in the past, to talk about how to help G become accustomed to being a big brother that my eyes were really opened. She asked what she could help us with today, and I said the main problem was helping G to respond the right way when E threatens to end him. That woman looked me dead in the eyes and asked me to repeat what I just said, only to listen to myself. Oh. She asked what grade G was in, and then said, So, you have about five years left of G being in your home before he goes to college. Is this how you want to spend those five years? Wake up call, big time. I knew things were bad, but at that moment, I knew things were not acceptable. So, we did the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life, and I've been through some stuff. We told the agency to find this poor kid a new home. We had made a commitment to healing this damaged child. We promised we were going to love and care for him forever. I made the mistake of telling him that. I told him that all the time, that I would love him and take care of him forever. That was my biggest mistake and biggest regret. When you put in your notice, they try to move the child within about a week. I cried so much that week. We didn't tell him until a couple of days before the move, because we knew how bad it was going to be. So I had to look at his little face every day and know how much we were about to hurt him how much more damage this was going to do to his life, how he could have had a chance with us, but we weren't willing to make that sacrifice, that our happiness and safety were more important than his. It was the worst feeling I've ever had, hurting someone so much, hurting a child, hurting someone we promised to protect. After we told him and the crying died down and a day went by without him saying anything about it, he quietly said to me, but you said that I would live here forever. You lied. There's no apologizing for that. There's no coming back. Only pure heartbreak. It's been a little over six months since he left. We have no rights to know how he is. I think about him every day. But, and please don't judge me too harshly for saying this, I don't regret sending him to a new family. Unlike what we were told, things did go back to the way they were. We are all happy again. Our son, G, is his old, sweet, kind self again. Actually, things are better. We appreciate each other more. We appreciate how simple life is, how happy we are just being together. Sometimes I feel guilty for being so happy, because this happiness came at such a high price. A price I am not the one who has to pay for. I really wish this wasn't the one we're gonna end on. It is, by the way, but I wish it were somewhere in the middle or something. I think this is a very important story to be told, and I think Opie is really, I don't know, brave for saying it almost? I know they just typed it on Reddit or whatever, but it's a huge story, first of all, and it's a very intimate one, one without an easy answer or a good resolution. And those are hard stories to tell. I don't think OP did the wrong thing here, 
but I don't know what the right thing is either. There probably isn't one. It's just one of those messy, complicated life situations. The child was a legitimate threat, it seems, to not only their other child, but also them. And if they were doing their best, which it sounds like they were, to really try to get him on the right track and it wasn't working, what more can you do, I guess? It's a horrible, awful situation. And the child doesn't deserve it any more than OP does. Things were just not right about this meeting of people. And it's heartbreaking because they might have been, they could have been, but they just weren't. And it's hard to say if it's anyone's fault in particular. We don't know all of the details and quite possibly no one knows all of the details, only their own experiences of what happened. An absolutely heartbreaking story to end it on that absolutely had me in tears, you could probably tell. Anyway, thank you everyone so much for watching. If you're hoping to adopt at some point in your lives, I hope this last one doesn't dissuade you. But for now, have a wonderful day or night, wherever you are, and I will see you in the next one.